minus 21x plus 18. And then our divisor is going to be x minus 3. All right, so to review from last time, we're doing long division. We're doing the steps of division. Divide, multiply, subtract, bring down. So first we take x and we divide it into x cubed. So I'm basically taking x cubed and dividing it by x, which some of you do very quickly in your head. But if you're still a little confused how you get the answer to this, you can write it out long ways. x cubed is x times x times x divided by x. And so what happens is this x in the numerator and this x in the denominator divide into each other and give us 1. And so we're left with x squared. And so the shortcut for that is that if you have the same base, you just subtract your exponents. This is x to the first power. So you do 3 take away 1 is 2. And the reason is because 1x divides out with the denominator. So you're left with a lower term. So then I'm going to take this x squared and place it here. Up in my quotient, right? If you're not familiar with that term, you should be. The answer to your division is called your quotient. And now we're going to multiply. x squared times x is x cubed. x squared times negative 3 is negative 3x squared. And then we're going to subtract everything. x cubed minus x cubed is 0. 2x squared minus a negative becomes plus a positive, and that's 5x squared. And then we bring down the negative 21x. And then I believe it was, uh, I believe it was actually Caleb Scott who said, now rinse and repeat. Right? So now we're going to do the same thing. We're going to take x and we're going to divide it into 5x squared. So Again, you've got 5x squared, and you're dividing that by x. Some of you can just think of that answer in your head. If you can't, you can just expand this out. When you divide by your x, these x's divide into each other, and you get 5x. So we put this 5x up in our quotient. And then we multiply. 5x times x makes 5x squared. And 5x minus 3 makes negative 15x. And we subtract everything. 5x squared minus 5x squared makes 0. Negative 21x minus a negative becomes plus a positive. And so then we have negative 6x. And then we bring down our plus 18. So now I take negative 6x and divide it by x. And so that's going to give me negative 6. Place that negative 6 there in my quotient. Then I'm going to multiply negative 6 times x, negative 6x. Negative 6 times negative 3 is positive 18. I subtract everything, and that gives me 0. And because I got a remainder of 0, what does that tell me? What have I found out by doing this problem? I found this quotient. And how is this quotient then related to the dividend? It's a factor. right? So because my remainder came out to 0, I now know that x minus 3 multiplies by x squared plus 5x minus 6 to equal my original function. I'll just put equals f of x. So the entire purpose of doing the division is to find the factor. Why do we want to find the factor? Because then we can factor and find the roots. Why do we want to know the roots? Because the roots are where y equals 0. 
And so whatever our graph is meant to model, that's going to be an important point on the graph. And that's what all of this is about. Okay, so here is synthetic division, which is a shortcut. And I know that everybody is always like, Ms. Collier, why didn't you show us the shortcut in the first place? Because the shortcut only works for some division. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. So here's how synthetic division works. As we do it, you may remember it from last year. First, you look at your exponents and you make sure that they are decreasing. Three, two, one, zero. You make sure none of them are missing. If you are missing, like if we didn't have an x squared, we'd need to put in a zero placeholder for that. But this is good. Three, two, one, zero. So thumbs up on that. So we write down the coefficient of each term. So that's a 1. That's a 2. That's a negative 21. And that's an 18. All right. Then you're going to make this kind of design. It's almost like an upside down division box. And you leave a row here because we're going to put some numbers in here. All right, then you come over here and look at your divisor. Whatever this is, you take the negative of it and you put that number here. So since this is negative 3, negative negative 3 is positive 3. Okay, now here are the steps of synthetic division. We start with bring down. So you bring down the 1. And then we multiply 3 times 1. 3 times 1 makes 3, and we put that answer right there. But now instead of subtracting, we're going to add. 2 plus 3 is 5. And now we repeat the steps. We go 3 times 5 is 15. We take the 15 and put it here under the negative 21. And then we add these. And we get negative 6. And then we do 3 times negative 6 makes negative 18. And we put that there. And then we add those and we get 0. All right, we mark this off. This zero is our remainder. It's going to abbreviate remainder. And then from that point, this is our constant term. This is our x to the first power. This is our x to the second power. And so our answer is x squared plus 5x minus 6. <gasps> Look! the same answer. Okay, let's talk a minute about why this works. Alright, you see how this is going to come out to be x squared, which is one degree less than the x cubed. Well, that's always going to work because what's your first step in division? You're dividing x into this number, and so you're going to get one degree lower. Why are we take, taking this negative 3 and putting it over here and making it negative? Because when we do long division, we subtract. When we do synthetic division, we add. Adding is the opposite of subtracting, or subtracting is the opposite of adding. So we make that number the opposite, and that's why we add instead of subtracting. And that works out really awesome, don't you think? Now, the thing is, you can only do synthetic division, so this way, synthetic division, your divisor has to be in the form x plus or minus c, a constant. 
So if you have an x squared, an x cubed, an x to the fourth, it won't work. Synthetic division doesn't work. You have to do long division in that case. So it has to be a first degree. So like x squared is not going to work on synthetic division. So long division works on everything. Synthetic division does not. All right, so let me give you a few to try. All right, so if you will go ahead and grab some books, and I'll give you a page number in your book, and you'll just do a few synthetic division problems. Paper. All right, we're going to go to page 115. So here are your solutions. Number 19, x cubed plus x squared plus 5x plus 4 plus 2 over x minus 2. On number 20, 2x squared minus 2x, I'm sorry, 2x cubed minus 2x squared plus 4x minus 4 plus 8 divided by x plus 3. And then number 22 was x to the fourth minus 2x cubed plus x squared plus 4x plus 1 plus 4 over x plus 2. So I have number 22 worked out here. And the key to remembering this one is you need to put a zero placeholder because this was x to the fifth. And then we skipped over to negative 3x cubed, and they didn't have an x to the fourth in the problem. So you need that zero placeholder, because in synthetic division, these coefficients have to go down by one degree. And so if you don't have that degree in your polynomial, you need a zero placeholder. So that's one spot where synthetic division can get a little tricky. All right, any questions there? Do you like that better than long division? Most people do. But remember, it doesn't work for all divisors. So be careful that you don't try and use it on a problem that has an x squared. All right, we are now going to go on and look at something else called the rational root theorem or rational root test. So it's called a rational root theorem, a rational root test. Some people call it the rational zero theorem because a zero is a root. So let's make sure we remember what rational numbers are. Rational comes from the root word ratio, and that's a fraction. So this little test helps you know all possible rational roots. So it's not saying that they are roots. It's saying that these are the only things that could be roots. 
All right, I'm going to write it out symbolically the way we do in math, and I'm going to explain to you what all these variables mean. It looks harder than it is. So the general way to write a, a generic general polynomial says a to the n times x to the nth power plus a sub n minus 1 to the x times n minus 1 power plus some other stuff in the middle. So we put dot, dot, dot plus a sub 1 to the x plus a sub 0. All right, that can look very frightening, but here's all it means. It means that you have a polynomial of degree n, and it's written in descending order. So your exponents are going down until you get to a constant term. These a's are your coefficients. They have little subscripts because all the coefficients are not the same, right? So it just says this is the coefficient that belongs with x to the n power. This is the coefficient that belongs to the n minus 1 power. It's just a way to name the different coefficients. All right, so the rational root test says take the factors of the constant, divided by S, factors of the leading coefficient. And whatever fractions you get, those are all the possible rational roots you can have. So here's an example. Oh, well, let's go back up here and talk a minute. Do you know where the constant is? The number that has no x, the number that's just a number and is not being multiplied by any variable at all, that's your constant right there. Leading coefficient, we know, is the number multiplied by the highest um, exponent. So this right here, that's your LC, your leading coefficient. Okay, so let's say I had 2x cubed minus 4x plus 4. So I start with my constant term. What are all the things that multiply together to make 4? Right? 1 times 4 and 2 times 2. So if I put them in order, 1, 2, and 4. Those are all the factors, right? Uh, but couldn't I have negative 2 times negative 2? Yeah. Or negative 1 times negative 4? So I actually have to come put a plus or a minus in front of all these because it could also be a negative times a negative. All right, so now I look at my leading coefficient. That's a 2. What are all the factors of 2? Just 1 and 2. But those could be positive or negative, right? So now I just go divide each numerator by each denominator. So 1 divided by 1 is 1, 2 divided by 1 is 2, and 4 divided by 1 is 4, right? And then a positive divided by a negative would be a negative. So I'm going to have positive and negative 1, positive and negative 2, and positive and negative 4. Right? Each one of these divided by 1 is going to give me both the positive and the negative option. All right, so now I have to divide each one of these by 2. So 1 divided by 2... Well, that's just one half. We're just going to write it as a fraction. Plus or minus one half. What's two divided by two? One. Oh, that's already on our list. No need to write it over. 
it's there. What's 4 divided by 2? Two? 2. It's 2. Oh, that's already on our list. So these are all of my possible rational roots. Okay. So, so far when we've done division, you've been given the divisor. Remember when we did long division? It was like, divide this. Oh, by the way, x minus 2 is a divisor. Okay, well, in the real world, if you had a polynomial, nobody is going to come whisper to you like, hey, try this divisor, right? You have to know where to start. You have to find one factor to get the ball rolling. So the rational root test gives you a short list to try. I would not even try and see if x minus 3 can divide into this because this test tells me it will not. I'm not even going to try x plus 5. It's not going to work. These are the only ones that might work. And when I say work, what do I mean? I mean if I put them in, this is going to equal 0. They're going to be a factor. So, you could plug them each in, you could plug them in and find which one is zero. Or the other thing you can do is you can do synthetic division, right? And if you come out with a zero remainder, then ding, 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 you found a factor. Okay? So that is the purpose of the rational root theorem. All right, we've got our books on page 115. We're going to do a couple of these. Not too many, because once you do one or two, you'll have the idea. Page Sorry, we're not on, we're, it's not 115. We have to turn to a new page. It's going to be on page, page So on page 127, just do numbers 2 and 4. Page 127, 2 and 4. I'll write that here. And don't follow, the directions tell you to do several things. I just want you to do the rational root test. That's all. Just do the rational root test. Page 127, number 2 and number 4.
All right. Check in with your partners. So these should be your lists. Now, here's the thing. They're not all going to be roots, right? So on number two, our leading term, our leading term was 4x cubed. So what's the most number of roots this guy can have? Remember, whatever your degree is, that's the most roots you can have. So this has at most three roots. This list is just telling you what they might be. They are not all going to work. I want you to understand that. Now, back in the day, we would, we would do synthetic division or we'd plug these in and we'd test every single one. We live in uh, 2022 and you do have calculators. So grab a calculator if you don't have one. And go to y equals. And we want to type in problem 2. It says 4 x and to the third power. Does everybody know their uh, little to the button on top of the division? Your little carrot or your little up thingy here. And then arrow over and then minus 24x squared. And then minus x and then plus 6. All right, you guys double check me. Did I type that in correctly? Got my correct signs and everything. Okay, before I even press the graph button, it's a cubic function with a positive leading coefficient. So we know as x approaches infinity, it's going to approach infinity. And as x approaches negative infinity, it's going to approach negative infinity. We know what that end behavior looks like. And we graph it. So there we have it. It's approaching infinity. Down there it's approaching negative infinity. Do you see that it, there's three roots? One, 
two, three. Now sometimes the roots might be on an integer and so we could find that root right there. One, two, three, four, five, six is on our list. So I bet it's six. Okay, so we can use the table to help us. So go to second table. Well, let me change my table set for a minute because I had done something a little weird. And if I go to the number six, yes, six is a zero. All right. So I have a root. Six is one of my roots. Okay. Look, it said positive one might be a root, but can you look on your table? Is positive one going to be a root? No. Well, what about negative one? Let me go check that one out. Oh, now see how positive and negative one did not work? Positive two and negative two, they didn't work. Positive three and negative three, that didn't work. All right, we knew positive six works. I wonder about negative six. No, negative six didn't work. How am I going to get to positive one half on my calculator? So, I didn't see anybody volunteering there. I need to change the table set. So I'm going to go to second window for table set. And instead of counting by ones, I'm going to count by point ones. All right? And go back to table. This will give me decimals. And now I can go find negative a half. Oh, looky there. So, negative one-half is a root. wonder about positive one-half. Oh, positive one-half is another root. Do I need to check any more? Because how many roots can I possibly have? Three. One, two, three. I don't even need to check the other ones. They're not going to work. Those are my three roots. Let me go back to my graph. Do you see them? Negative one half, positive one half, and six. But your rational root test tells you where to look for them. So you're not just looking everywhere. I compared this to like, you know when Stuco hides stuff for us to find? And Miss Collier never finds them. Like some nice Stuco member might like just put the next one right by my door so I could see it. Just saying. But anyway, you know when you're looking all over the whole school to find some little elf or something. But then what if somebody told you, oh, I'm going to give you a hint. It's in the 220 hallway. Do you still have to look for it? Did they just make your job a whole lot easier? That's what the rational root test does. It says, hey, don't look at all the numbers for your rational roots. Just look at these numbers and find the zeros. Okay? So that's literally how the rational root test helps you. It lets you know that there's only certain things that might be zeros. So don't even try some of these other numbers. Make sense to you? We got any questions about it? Okay, let me talk a minute to my not seniors. Um, there was one day when the seniors went and did something else and we talked a little bit about classes for next year. But today I want to actually call you up one at a time and talk to you about your... Did I call you up one at a time already? Yeah, I didn't think so. I just kind of talked to you in general. 
So I want to call you up one at a time and talk about your class for next year and make sure we're good to go with that. But while we're all doing that, you can start on your IXL. It's going to be D6. And your smart score only has to go to 80. And then while you're doing that, I'm going to talk to all the not seniors. All right, Angel, come see me. Hello, have a seat. So, are you an IB student? No. Okay. Do you know what math you picked for next year? Uh, AP statistics. AP statistics. And what do you want to be after you graduate? Uh, I'm going into the modern career. Awesome. All right. I think AP stats is a great choice for you. That's appropriate. So. Okay. Mitchell, come see me. Have a seat, sir. Hi, how are you doing? And do you know what math class you chose for next year? Mm -hmm. uh, IB analysis. IB analysis. Are you a full diploma student? Yes. You are. Okay. So IB analysis, that's a good spot for you. Mm -hmm. You are going to have to stay on track of your work a little bit better than you have been this spring. You did much better in the fall with tracking things. Okay? But you don't want to get behind in that. All right. I'm, this is, I'm excited for next year. I think that IB analysis class is going to be a really great group of students. So, all right. Thank you. That's good. Kenta, come see me. Hello, sir. Are you an IB student? No. no. I'm partial. Partial I'm IB. Diploma. Not at full diploma. And so what math did you pick for next year? I'm doing um, AP Calc BC. AP Calc BC. That is very appropriate for you. Um, you should do just fine in there. Um, do you know, are you going to have a dismiss block? Yeah. Do you have first all class? First block, okay. Well, it's always, I mean, uh, BC calculus is challenging. I think you're totally up for the challenge. I don't have any concerns with that. But it's good because I imagine you're taking some other advanced classes. And so having that dismiss block will build in a little bit of extra time for you to do homework and the like. So, so sounds great. Yeah. What did you hear, Simon? I don't know about AB difficult. Because I have friends in AB. Uh huh. So. And they said AB was difficult? And do you know anybody in BC? No. No? Okay. Because course wise, BC is the higher level course. But um, I have also heard that the AB teacher kind of grades partially. So. Okay. Who teaches BC? Uh, right now, Mr. Mueller teaches BC. So, but yeah, it's just with, uh, you're just going to stay on track with your homework. And again, uh, with you having first block dismissed, that builds in this little extra time. And that'll be good. But you've got a strong math background. So you should do great in there. Yes. All right, Lauren, come see me. Hello, ma'am. How are you? All right, are you an IB student? No, partial. Partial. Do you know what math you pick? Next AP year? stats. AP stats. And what do you want to do in your future? Psychology. Uh, 
AP stats, totally appropriate then, because you will need to take stats in college. All right. The AP stats, we may or may not be able to have dual credit with it. Mm -hmm. Are you doing dual credit in pre-cal? Yes. Yes. So if, if I teach AP stats, it'll be dual credit, mm -hmm. or if we hire somebody else who's got the criteria, it'll be dual credit. If not, then you can take the AP test and get your college credit that way. So it's going to be one if, they, if they ended up having dual credit, I was going to do dual credit. Okay. Well, awesome. Sounds great. Okay. Can I move the restroom? Yes, you can. Caleb, come see me. Hello, sir. How are you? Good. Uh, are you an IB student? No. No. Do you know what math you're taking next year? Yeah. What did you pick? AP Calculus AB. AP Calculus AB. Why did you pick AB? Because it's easier. Uh-huh. Why do you make hundreds on everything in here? Yeah, but I'm also taking AP Physics 2 and Engineering 3. Are you going to have a dismiss block at yes. all? Yes. I would encourage you to take BC. And the way honors classes go, if you get four weeks in and you're drowning, you can drop to AB. But, um, which you may want to do. Do you know oh, anybody yeah. taking BC this year? Yeah. yeah. Have you visited with them about BC calculus and how much work it is? Or no. Talk with them about it because you are an exceptional.